Good evening, everybody. Hope everybody had a good day and got to enjoy the sun. Um, my name is Heather Boykman. I'm an AmeriCorps member. And I'm from Chagrin River Watershed Partners. And today we are joined by Curtis Wagner of ODNR's Division of Wildlife. We will be having a Q&A at the end of the presentation. And you could, you can be submitting questions in the question area while the presentation's going. Um, this webinar is being recorded and you can rewatch it at Chagrin River Watershed Partners YouTube channel. And you can also check out past speaker series. All right, Curtis, you ready to take it away? Sure. All right. All right. Well, thank you everyone for taking time out of your evening to, to join us. I appreciate that. Um, so yeah, like, like Heather said, uh, my name is Kurt Wagner. I, I'm with the ODNR Division of Wildlife. So I'm the fisheries management supervisor for what we call District 3, which is Northeast Ohio. We cover 19 counties. And you know our, our role is broad. We deal with all things uh, fisheries management, um, lakes, rivers, streams, um, and then certainly partnering with our, our Lake Erie biologists as well. So um, tonight, talking about something that I think is pretty uh, exciting and intriguing. Um, and lots of both science surrounding uh, non-native species, as well as lots of, of media interest and, and, and stories that sort of grab the, the populace. So uh, I figured we're gonna dive into a little bit talking about Lake Erie non-native species, aquatic non-natives, and uh, specifically I'm gonna talk about sort of the case, his, case story, case history of, of three of those. So I'm titling it A Tale of Three Strangers because we're gonna talk about um, organisms that were not native to the Lake Erie or the Great Lakes for that matter, um, but they are here now and it raises the question, does it matter and what do we do about it and um, you know, how does it affect the way things are or were? So, um, oh, my advance is not working. Okay, let's try something else. There we go. Um, so before we get into it, I just want to talk a little bit about terminology. So I'm going to try my best to, to keep saying non-native, um, but even in the science fields professionally, we, we so easily and loosely interchange all these terms. We, we say invasive species and you know invaders and non-native and exotics and introduced. Um, I mean, just to name a few, I'm sure I'm missing some. And, and, and oftentimes I think we think we know what we're talking about. We, we use them loosely and interchangeably, but I think there are some differences and, and I, I wanna sort of peel back the layers on that a little bit tonight. Um, so in the Great Lakes uh, to today to count, there's somewhere upwards of uh, 180 plus non-native aquatic species in the Great Lakes system. And I understand, I mean, this figure here, you know, on your screen, you're not gonna see exactly what they are, but this is just sort of the mosaic of, of fish and planktons and plants that are all considered, you know, aquatic organisms that are not native to the Great Lakes. Um, this number just, you know, ticks up by the year. So, you know, the three I'm going to talk about have interesting case studies and, and, you know, ramifications. But, you know, there's plenty that we're not going to address, and there's plenty that, unfortunately, um, will likely be coming, you know, in the future. So tonight, let's talk a little bit about, you know, non-natives in the Great Lakes. You know, how and why they get here, and why so many. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about what the ODNR Division of Wildlife's responsibility is in this. Um, you know, I'm, I'm obviously going to be presenting from an ODNR perspective. It's, you know, the world I live in, but um, as you'll see in these case studies, uh, these dealing with non-native species is a huge uh, sort of example of partnerships. So I'm going to be talking about university partners, federal partners, other state partners, um, that, that all work together when we start talking about how to, you know, deal with and, and sort of think about non-native species. Um, then I'm going to get into the three stories. We're going to talk about sea lamprey, we're going to talk about grass carp, and we will talk about steelhead trout. So, um, you know, you, I can't hear you or see you, but maybe there is some like gasps of awe. Are we, are we lumping steelhead in with non-natives? And indeed, they are not native to the Great Lakes. Uh, there are species that are there, and we'll talk about them. And then if there's time, which I hope I move fast enough, uh, we'll get into some questions. So first, non-natives in the Great Lakes. So 
The Great Lakes are definitely a hot spot uh, continentally, even globally. They are, they are considered a hot spot for, for non-native species. Um, there's a number of reasons. I want to sort of talk about why that's the case. So this is, you know, a map broadly uh, of the Great Lakes region. Um, first, there's a direct connection to the Atlantic Ocean. And so, you know, the St. Lawrence River up into Lake Ontario, um, you know, is and has been connected. But, you know, Niagara Falls for a very long time kept species from getting any, for, any further up into the Great Lakes um, and, and kept ships, for that matter, from, from uh, traversing up into the, the rest of the Great Lakes. Um, in the 1800s, the Welland Canal was built, had you know, some renovations in the early 1900s. Um, an amazing engineering feat, uh, lots of good things, opened up lots of commerce and business and jobs and goods. It also lets uh, organisms get further up into the Great Lakes, as well as vessels that may be carrying organisms, which we'll talk about. Another reason uh, that the Great Lakes kind of acts as such a hot spot for, for non-native species is, especially in the southern part of the, of the Great Lakes, some major population centers. Um, so not only do you have ports where you know ships from the Atlantic are coming in, you have among Great Lakes transportation going port to port, moving goods quickly, and then you have lots of cultural diversity, you know, um, transient in and out of people, and with that comes pet trade and recreators, you know, boaters, anglers, um, cultural customs that involve live fish. You have all these things right on the, the shore of, of these Great Lakes. Um, which can serve as vectors of, of non-native species. So we also have the fact that um, some naturally and some through, again, uh, amazing feats of early century engineering, we have these connections between the Ohio River drainage and the Lake Erie, uh, sorry, not Lake Erie, the Great Lakes drainage as a whole. And I just put in red three of these. Um, you know, we have the, the Chicago connection, which you may have heard about in lieu of Big Head and Silver Carp with the electric barrier in Chicago, but we have, you know, a marshy wetland and northeastern Indiana that connects in flood stage to the Lake Erie drainage. And then even here near my office in the Akron area, there's connections between the Ohio drainage and the Great Lakes drainage that um, have to be dealt with uh, to sort of sever the ability of organisms to, to move across watersheds. And then lastly, the fact that just simply the Great Lakes region as a whole it is very broad latitudinally. So there's, there's plenty of ability for species that get introduced to sort of find where they most live and adapt, whether they want a very cold, deep, uh, you know, um, oligotrophic uh, system up north or, or, you know, warm, shallow eutrophic system in the south, uh, Great Lakes kind of has it all. And so, you know, you factor these all together and, and we see lots and lots of non-native species. So I pulled some of these figures from kind of a summary article in Journal of Great Lakes Research, which sort of categorizes various non-native aquatic species in the Great Lakes. Um, the first figure here just kind of looks at the, the range of organism types um, that are, that are non-native in the Great Lakes. So the, the left axis, the vertical axis is just number of species. And so we see sort of, you know, the, the from low to high with, you know, aquatic plants really, you know, being the, the highest of, of non-native species, um, algaes and then fish are right in there. So tonight, uh, you know, I'm gonna talk about three fish species. I'm a fisheries biologist. So that is what I will focus on. Um, this is kind of the same type of figure, number of species is the height of the bar. But now this is talking about kind of where do these non-natives come that are, you know, the current suite of non-native species in the Great Lakes. And far and away, uh, we see Eurasia is represented. Uh, tonight, I'm gonna talk about um, you know, species from the Atlantic, so sea lamprey. Uh, I'm gonna definitely do a species from Eurasia. So the grass carp is from uh, you know, Asia and Russia. And then uh, I'm gonna talk about Western US. That's the steelhead. You know, steelhead are native to the US. They're native to the, the Western seaboard, um, but non-native in the Great Lakes. And then lastly, as we kind of split these non-natives into categorical bins, uh, we're going to talk about sort of how they got there. So, you know, unintentional release, that, that's sort of lumping a lot together. Um, some of them, you, they don't know, they just got here. Uh, so, you know, that's, that's one of the highest, and you'll see that the highest category is shipping. So, you know, that well and canal and that connection to global shipping and then subsequently within the lakes, uh, port to port shipping, it really does move critters around, um, you know, ballast water, which is water that goes into the hull of ships to, you know, keep the balance correct. Um, you know, as those 
take on ballast water across the globe, come over towards the Great Lakes and exchange the ballast water. Now you've just brought a whole suite of anything that could have gotten to the pumps, you've brought it across the globe. Uh, and there's now some rules that, that deal with exchanging ballast offshore and salt water. Um, but nonetheless, a lot of the species that have arrived here have come from shipping ballast water and, and you know, various pathways related to that. So uh, tonight we'll talk about um, one of the species. So it's the, the Atlantic species, the sea lamprey that came through the canal. Uh, we will talk about sort of an unintentional release, and that's going to be the story of the grass carp. And then we'll talk about a deliberate release, and, and that's the steelhead um, that, you know, we're, we're put there for a purpose, and we'll discuss, you know, why that is. And so, you know, lastly, I mentioned earlier these terms, and I want to kind of put a framework here that, that some folks in Florida put together, you know, so we have on this at the spectrums native and invasive, and, and sort of we we think native is good and we say invasive with you know this very red, angry, negative connotation. And then so, so, sort of in the middle, we have these words of non-native, introduced, established. Um, so we're gonna, as we talk about these three case studies, we're gonna kind of talk about wh what does it take to truly be an invasive species? Um, what if it's just non-native or what if, you know, is it because it's established, does that mean it's invasive? So, you know, we're gonna sort of, try to define and, and understand the terms. And I think we'll leave the evening kind of concluding that it's not just as simple as putting species in different categories that kind of each species has its own story. All right, so a little bit about the division of wildlife and, and our roles and responsibilities in this. Um, a lot of you probably do think of the division of wildlife as that agency that sells deer tags and tells me how many walleye I can keep. And so that's true. We definitely are um, rooted in and, and very involved in, you know, what we call the hook and bullet activities, the hunting, the fishing, the trapping. Um, but if you look at our, you know, legislative mandate and our mission, I mean, what we are about is conserving, improving fish and wildlife resources and their habitats for the sustainable use and appreciation by all. So it doesn't say just make sure there's walleye and deer to shoot and for hunters and anglers only, you know, so, um, we take this mission seriously and we do get involved in a lot more than your, your game fish and your huntable animals um, by dealing and addressing non-native species, um, especially ones that will have sort of harmful effects. We are working to conserve and improve those native fish and wildlife resources for all Ohioans and hopefully for the use and appreciation by everyone. So, so that is the sort of mission and the driver that, that structures what we do. Um, but, you know, you, you, just saying what you do isn't enough. So let's peel back and talk about kind of the funding and, and what, what we use to address these issues. So, um, you know, obviously an agency has sort of two main aspects of resources, dollars and people. And, um, you know, the people are, are definitely lined up with the expertise to, to help partner and deal with these non-natives. So what about the money? So a, a large part of the Division of Wildlife's annual budget does come from those traditional activities, the fishing and hunting license sales, the deer and turkey permits. And then that big 30% that you see there um, that we call federal aid. So these are federal grant programs um, supported and funded by excise tax on shooting, fishing, boating, hunting equipment um, that then are apportioned back to the states in a match format. Um, to, to sort of couple with those fishing and hunting license sales. So definitely the, the sportsmen and sportswomen are a, a, a huge funder of state fish and wildlife resource uh, agencies across the country, Ohio included. Uh, but there are other pots of money that also uh, are used to deal with uh, wildlife management and, and non-native species management. So this figure there on the left, the, the uh, wildlife and sport fish restoration logo, that's, that's what I just talked about. That's that big pot of money that comes matched up with the hunting and fishing license sales. But there's also um, the Great Lakes Restoration in Initiative. Uh, I'll probably uh, slip and call it GLRI. That's the, that's the acronym that we use. You know, Ohio has a, a pretty healthy amount of money that we're able to be the brokers of with that GLRI funds and, and apportion that out to deal with um, non-native species. And also there's the state wildlife grant program, a federal program for the states who have these wildlife action plans in place. So Ohio has a great wildlife action plan that allows us to capture those state wildlife grant monies to also do great work for the traditionally non-game, 
non-angled species and, and habitat conservation. All right, so let's get into the stories themselves of these species. So we'll start with sea lamprey. And uh, I wanna sort of pause here and, and acknowledge that, um, A, this is the first time I, I've given this talk I, and I sort of built this special for this webinar. I wanted to sort of think through these topics. But along with that, what I wanna point out is I did lean heavily on a lot of our partners for, for these slide content. So I, I wanna definitely give a shout out to folks at the US Fish and Wildlife Service, the USGS, University of Toledo, other Division of Wildlife uh, colleagues who sort of pitched in and gave me slides. So this is not all my original slide creation. So, and, I, and what prompted me to think about that was sea lamprey. I, I got a lot of this information from our uh, US Fish and Wildlife Service partners up in, up in Michigan. So these are the ugly little critters, sea lamprey. They're not so little, they can get uh, up to, you know, about two feet long or so. Um, and they are very much considered an ancient fish. They're, they're very interesting. Um, they're almost so ugly, they're, they're lovable, but unfortunately they, they do a lot of damage to, to our traditional fishes in the lake. Um, here you can see it sort of sucking onto the hand of an educator, sort of showing the mouth parts of these sea lamprey. So sea lamprey, they're native to the Atlantic Ocean. Um, so, you know, they're not the species that's from across the globe, but, but they're, they're evolved and adapted ecosystem that they call home is the Atlantic Ocean. Um, they're very adaptable. Obviously, they're in the Great Lakes, so they can handle, you know, quite a range of salinity down to, you know, practically zero. Um, they were first documented in Lake Erie in 1921. Of course, the, the Welland Canal was early 1800s. So, I mean, that, it's, it's very much believed that that's how they got into the Great Lakes is just working their way through the canal system. They have a, an adromous life cycle, which means, you know, they, they live out their life in a, a big water and then they swim up a flowing water to, to spawn, die, and then their offspring return back out to grow into the bigger water. So, excuse me, for the Great Lakes, what that means is they spawn in the Great Lakes tributaries, and then their, their little juveniles swim out into the lake, Lake Erie in this case, grow, feed on fish in the lake, and then come in as adults, uh, you know, later, three to five years later to, to spawn, there, and then they die. So that's how the life cycle works. And they're very devastating to native fishes. They'll, they'll latch on to anything, but their first preference definitely seemed to be the salmonid. So, you know, the native lake whitefish, the native lake trout um, are two, you know, very preferred preys. Um, and really the, the occurrence of them in the Great Lakes is, is part of what basically created the Great Lakes Fisheries Commission in the 1950s. And so, you know, uh, they're one of the, the big changes in the Great Lakes that prompted cooperative management between provinces and states to work together on Great Lakes uh, management topics. So the control for these began in Lake Erie in the mid 1980s and the stated objective from the Great Lakes Fish Commission and partners working together is to suppress the abundance of these sea lampreys to levels that will not impede what they call the, uh, the achievement of their fishery community objectives. So for, for each species or group of species in the Great Lakes, there's these uh, FCOs, these fish community objectives. And the goal is to keep lampreys at a low enough level that they're not the cause for not meeting these objectives. And, and very early on, it was, you know, realized that effective control uh, requires, you know, quite a bit of partnerships. And so, you know, tonight I'm going to talk about partnership between the Ohio Division of Wildlife and the U.S. Uh, Fish and Wildlife Service. But there's, you know, all the states, provinces, they're all kind of together on how to deal with these things. So this figure here, and I'm gonna to try to stay fairly light on figures and, and graphics tonight. Um, but this just kind of shows, uh, you know, there, how do you measure these guys in a whole, you know, lake ecosystem. Um, so there's various trapping and marking ways that they can do population estimates. So here's one of their population estimate uh, indices through about a 30 year period. You can see there in the sort of late 2000s, population got quite high and then it sort of worked its way down to, to you know, lows around 2020. And then, you know, the most recent estimate is kind of up again in that uh, eight to 10,000 individual mark. And you might think like eight to 10,000 individuals in all of Lake Erie in a way might not seem like a lot, um, but for the amount of damage each one can do, it still is a notable factor in, in structuring uh, Lake Erie fisheries. 
that the, the line you see there right around 3,300, that's the identified target level that the US Fish and Wildlife Service is shooting for. They would like to see this index at or below that 3,300 individual mark. So you can see that right now we are um, riding a little bit higher than that. Another way that, that you can sort of track the abundances of sea lamprey is through the marking rates on lake trout. And, and it's an ugly relationship because lake trout itself are a species, a native species that uh, states and provinces and the feds are working together to try to restore. So there's sort of some interplay between the status of the lake trout population itself and the sea lamprey. But nonetheless, it's a long-term data set. Um, you can see sort of the, the crashing of, of lake trout and the population at the same time there in the 80s of lamprey when control really kicked off. Like I said, control uh, kicked off in, in the mid 80s for lamprey. And then since then, just kind of this up and down uh, cycle of, of lake trout marking rates. So essentially what that is, is like if you capture, you know, an agency person captures a lake trout, does or does it not have a, a scar, a wound on it from a sea lamprey attaching to it. So obviously if the higher proportion of lake trout you handle have wounds, you would assume the sea lamprey population is higher. So that's just another way of tracking these sea lamprey uh, populations. So Lake Erie, all, all these black dots you see here on the, on the map, these are all uh, tributaries in Lake Erie, and, and the St. Clair is kind of included here, uh, tributaries in Lake Erie that have documented occurrence and, and reproduction of sea lamprey. So as you can see that, you know, they're getting into a lot of uh, tributaries, but the ones in the red are the ones that are, are really noted to have, you know, high levels of suitable spawning habitat, and hence also high levels of, of offspring production of these sea lamprey. And so these red dots, I believe there's six or seven of them, uh, they are the tributaries that are actually treated, and I'll get to what treated means. They're the ones that are actually treated for sea lamprey on a sort of every three to five year cycle in Lake Erie. So it's, you know, it's a fairly low proportion of all the tributaries that control measures actually occur in, but it captures or addresses a fairly large proportion of the lake-wide uh, production of lamprey. So control, what do I mean there? Uh, the primary method for uh, trying to keep sea lamprey in check is control with the lamprecide. We can call the lamprecide TFM. Um, I will not risk it and be wrong by saying the, the, the compound name of it. So we'll just stay with TFM, but nonetheless, so it's a the accepted lamprecide used throughout all the Great Lakes. Um, and it's, it's applied in the tributaries in April, May in the spawning season to, to then um, work down the stream across the habitats that the, uh, the uh, lamprey spawn in and it's supposed to target and kill the little larval uh, Yamasi lamprey. And so these are just some pictures here of doing some uh, water testing to get the, you know, the chemistry right and the dosages correct with the lamprecide. Um, I took some pictures. I went up to the Grand River last April when the Fish and Wildlife Service did their treatment and just took some pictures. I thought I'd share a few of those here with you tonight on the slides. Um, this is sort of uh, their headquarters lab trailer, if you will, where they, they do right there stream side, some assessments of water quality to make sure they're doing the right dosages. Um, I just kind of backed off and took this picture just to show the scale of it. And this is probably only capturing maybe a quarter, a third of all the, the employees that were involved in a treatment. It's quite the process. Um, here's just a picture of the, the stream side uh, application station. And if you look close enough, depending on how big your screen is and, and how, how uh, resolute it is, in the middle of the Grand River there, you can kind of see that yellowish orange tint. And so there's a line going across the river and there's sort of this pump drift station here on shore where the, the staff are, are putting out a specific dosage and it goes out through that application line and then mixes and flows downstream. And then every so often downstream, they have these booster sites that bring the, the concentration back up to the lethal level for lamprey with an attempt of not overshooting it and, and not having um, undue you know, bycatch lethality from other species that they're not intending to kill. And then there's a picture inside that lab trailer where they're continually sort of testing water samples uh, to make sure they're getting their dosages correct. So after they do the treatments, you know, uh, X number of, you know, days later, they go back, they, they do a larval survey and essentially see, you know, how good the treatment was. 
Um, so uh, this last treatment in the grand was pretty good. They did not see residual C. lamprey after the treatment, and nor did they discover new infestations that, that weren't part of the treatment. So in addition to the lamprecide as the main sort of control measure, uh, there's also other measures that can be taken that, that can be used um, depending on the river and the situation. So this here is the essentially the replacement of the Harpers Field Dam. If folks are familiar with Harpers Field, a very old dam, low head dam, dangerous, all the things about dams. Generally, we would say in ecology that taking dam, down dams is a good thing, and it is. In this case though, the Harpers Field Dam was an upstream movement barrier for sea lamprey, and above it was just tens of tens of miles of premier sea lamprey spawning habitat. So um, by having some sort of structure in place to stop sea lamprey from moving upstream, you're ultimately, you know, um, sort of money and ecologically ahead by stopping sea lamprey from getting up there in the first place and you were treating all those additional uh, river miles of habitat. So that was the construction of what, you know, I think people probably still colloquially would call the dam, but what this is, is this is a very uh, strategically designed sea lamprey barrier to stop the upstream migration of sea lamprey there at Harpers Field. Um, built into the barrier. So, I mean, the barrier itself is physically designed to keep lamprey from, from swimming upstream, but also they built into it these little um, conduits, I guess you would say, where they're gonna have a, a much more precise way of applying the lampreside in future years right into the, the flow and mixing it right away, rather than a little bit downstream where they had to do that, that line, which is really hard to get even disbursement of chemical across that line. So you know, hopefully make their treatment here um, even more fine tuned and, and focusing only on killing lamprey. And then there's a group within the Fish and Wildlife Service, the Supplemental Sea Lamprey Control Initiative, um, continually looking at and researching other ways to, to deal with sea lamprey beyond just lampreyside. And so looking at things like trapping, electric barriers, releasing sterile males um, to sort of uh, make the female's reproduction unsuccessful. And um, collectively, you know, these stream supplements where they've been implemented definitely in more of an experimental scale, but they have seen reductions of, you know, about $450,000 of lampreyside where they do these supplemental controls um, a decrease in the juvenile production. And ultimately the goal then would be, can you do this enough to decrease the treatment frequency, um, both from an ecological impact standpoint, as well as a cost standpoint. So let's kind of dig into the numbers. Lastly, before we leave this story, uh, a little bit about sea lamprey. So an individual adult can kill about 40 pounds of fish a year. Um, I see I spelled killed wrong. <laughs> uh, so, you know, you add up the number of adults in the lake and you get, you start getting into that, you know, eight, 10,000 adult lamprey number in Lake Erie, you are talking about, you know, a lot of fish that they're, they're preying upon and killing. And like I said, they target the, the, the native salmonids, so the lake trout and lake, lake whitefish, two species that, you know, restoration work is, is happening towards. And they will certainly um, predate on and kill steelhead then as well. Uh, which you know is a non-native species itself, which we'll talk about here in a second. Um, but in the absence of those, I mean, they will really latch onto anything um, in in the lake. So uh, they just prefer these fish if they can get a hold of them. So a little bit about the numbers here. So Ohio alone, Ohio's Lake Erie fishery is valued at between 700 and 800 million dollars of economic value. There's about 400,000 anglers who identify themselves as you know at least some of the time in the year fishing Lake Erie. So, you know, a huge recreational economic component there in Lake Erie. And on the Great Lakes scale as a whole, so mind you, the sea lamprey are, 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 are throughout all of the Great Lakes. So on the Great Lakes scale as a whole, uh, the fisheries are valued at over 7 billion um, in economic valuation and supporting over 75,000 jobs. So this is not uh, insignificant, people and dollars we're talking about here that depend on um, enjoying and using fisheries. So what does sea lamprey control cost? Interestingly, uh, Lake Erie only represents about 3% of the Great Lake wide effort and cost for sea lamprey control. Um, it, there's definitely much longer, bigger, more robust tributaries in some of the other Great Lakes that, that suck up a lot of that program cost. 
Uh, but nonetheless, it's about, about $500,000 spent annually from, by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. This is a federal expenditure on sea lamprey control in Lake Erie. And so I kind of highlighted in blue the comparison, you know, a half a million dollars spent in Erie for the control of sea lamprey versus the seven to $800 million just for Ohio's portion alone of the Lake Erie uh, fishery. And then on a Great Lakes scale, uh, collectively, about $25 million is spent annually across all the Great Lakes by the US Fish and Wildlife Service for sea lamprey control. So a very large sum of money, no doubt, it's a very big budget line, um, but contrast that again in the yellow with the, the, the value of Great Lakes fisheries. And again, you can see um, it is probably money well spent. Okay, so moving on to grass carp. So first, the grass carp are not silver carp. Uh, if, if you sort of pay attention to the, the carp media at all in the last five to 10 years, you know, the media loves picking up the video of, you know, a river full of, of carp just jumping and flying up and hitting people, uh, you know, go spend some YouTube time tonight and you'll have some funny videos if you put in silver carp. But this is not the grass carp. These are the a little docile cousin that stays underwater. Um, that looks like this. So uh, grass carp are one of the Asian carps and we sort of shifted to calling them invasive carps now. Um, but you know, these include the big head, silver, black and grass carp or, or white aimer is another name for them. And they're native to Eastern Asia, Eurasia. So this is the across the globe non-native species here that we're gonna tell a story about. And the adults can get, of grass carp can get big between 25 and 40 inches long, 10 to 30 pounds. Um, they, they, are, they were brought to the US intentionally. They were brought in the 70s to Southern US aquaculture and a little bit into some sort of sewage and treatment type settings as well. If you think about that era of the 60s and 70s, you know, sort of have Rachel Carson, Silent Spring, the realization of DDT uh, with bird egg nests, or sorry, bird egg shells. Um, so there's, you know, this mo ecological movement happening, a push to get away from chemicals and, and go to more bio solutions. And so this suite of uh, carps from Eurasia were brought over to deal with excessive vegetation and plankton and, and mussel, you know, mollusks and, and the associated parasites in aquaculture settings in the deep south. But as, as nature does, uh, rivers flood, ponds flood, these fish all kind of got out of their confines and have sort of dispersed up the Mississippi drainage, Missouri drainage, Ohio River drainage in, in this map you can see you know, spreading across the, the country. So in the 1980s, um, again, in the South, uh, a pretty interesting development to sort of pressure treat eggs at, that you could make grass carp triploid instead of diploid. So sort of three pairs of chromosomes instead of two, it makes them sterile. Um, they cannot reproduce with one another. And the thought being that indeed grass carp did have and still do have a, a useful role in like pond management, for example. Um, some of you listening may have grass carp in your ponds. Um, they are useful at eating aquatic plants to keep them from becoming uh, overgrown. And so triploidy, it was an attempt at still using the species beneficially, uh, but not creating a situation where the species can reproduce. And so there are varied regulations even now across North America. Um, basically, the, the, the full extent of Canada does not allow uh, the grass carp at all. Um, and in the yellow allows triploids only. And then there's still a few states in the green here that are allowing diploids as well. And so there is a market out of the South aquaculture world for both triploid grass carp and still diploid grass carp um, with regulations kind of varying. So a little bit of the timeline in the US, you can really even call this in Ohio in general. Um, so we have the 60s grass carp being imported into the US, um, the 80s, the development, like I said, of the, the triploidy process for, for making sterile grass carp, if you will. Um, 1980s is the first reports of grass carp by commercial fishermen in Lake Erie. Um, you, you move forward, 1988 is when the, the, the Ohio Division of Wildlife uh, required only triploids being allowed for sale and possession in Ohio. Uh, moving into 2012, um, diploid grass carp that originated in Sandusky were captured, so we're starting to capture wild diploids. Um, and then through the teen, you know, 2015 through 2020, um, eggs being found, evidence of reproduction, and, and mainly in the Sandusky Amami River system. So that's the Western Basin of Lake Erie in those large river tributaries 
starting to see evidence of spawning populations of diploid grass carp. And um, getting in towards 2020, um, various agencies work together to start kind of coming up with management plans. So why are grass carp a threat? Um, bottom line is they harm the aquatic ecosystems where they're abundant. So they are pretty vora voracious eaters of aquatic plants and they can eat up to about 100% of their body weight per day. So uh, they're just like these giant vacuum cleaners of plants. And the problem being that, you know, wetlands on Lake, Lake Erie shoreline wetlands, coastal wetlands are kind of at a premium as it is. They're, they're a much impacted habitat. Um, one that we are trying to sort of reverse the trend a little bit with programs like the H2 Ohio program to restore wetlands. Um, but as we have precious few wetlands, um, and we're trying to restore more, the last thing you want is a non-native species coming in, chowing down every wetland plant that they can get a hold of. And so they're, they're very much threatening the near shore and, and estuarian uh, ecology of Lake Erie. So unlike sea lamprey, which came in, grew like thunder, and really had a negative impact on a large scale before control started, uh, we do know that in Lake Erie, we're, we're kind of on the left side of this, this curve here uh, on your screen for the grass carp. They were detected at fair, very low numbers. Um, and so we're kind of over in the species arrival, prevention, potential eradication world. And really, as the, as the caption here says, now's the time for action. You, 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 you want to try to contain or eradicate before you slide to the right on this, on this scale and you build up abundances, you build up costs, and you really enter into a scenario of long-term control instead of possibly you know, eradication. So that's sort of where we're at on the grass carp thing. Um, very recently, the Division of Wildlife has put together uh, a grass carp response strategy. So sort of a guiding document on how to apply science-based adaptive management to, to dealing with these. Um, and what I wanna point out with this is that it is a very involved, very partnership rich approach in the response to grass carp because no one agency or entity has all the money or people or resources to sort of understand the layers that need to be understood to correctly try to uh, remove these species from the lake. So we're not going to go into this figure, but you can just see there's everything from modeling and telemetry and research that involves universities, federal agencies, and the state. Um, lots of partnerships happening here. Um, but what are the main sort of, uh, you know, thrusts being put at, at controlling grass carp? So one is trying to prevent their establishment. I mean, obviously they're already established in, at certain places in low numbers, but how do we prevent more? So, you know, we're very much taking seriously those various connections that I pointed out earlier between the Ohio River drainage and the Lake Erie drainage. Um, so the last thing you want is, you know, a diploid grass carp that might be in somebody's pond, getting out, into a creek, being able to get across the divide into Lake Erie. So dealing with those watershed connections. And then in 2015, 2016, the Division of Wildlife took a, a pretty uh, intensive sort of undercover approach to sort of testing and, and probing into that supply chain of triploid grass carp, just to see that on the market are fish that are triploid, really, really triploid. And uh, yeah, of 1,200 fish tested, they were all triploid. So, you know, the established, legit, you know, up and up market is definitely being very secure on getting triploid fish to the markets. Um, so that was that was good news there. But the other thing for preventing, preventing establishment is just kind of keeping an eye on the commercial bait industry. And that goes from educating anglers, educating the mom and pop bait shops, and then still keeping check on the big shipments of, of bait that are, that are coming into the state. These pictures here are juvenile fish. And, you know, Boy, unless you're a, a fisheries biologist or really looking for it, you could easily call that juvenile grass carp up at the top, a fathead minnow or a shiner. I mean, it could just be in your bait bucket without you even realizing it. Here it's contrasted again against emerald shiner and, and gizzard shad, which are both also used as bait uh, on Lake Erie. So um, at those sizes, it could be really easy for juvenile grass carp to slip into the, into the mix. Also working to sort of close knowledge gaps, and, and I don't need to go through all these, but there's issues of um, origin, where did these diploids that we're seeing in the Sandusky mommy come from, so you can use oolith microchemistry, understanding movements and spawning sites, um, understanding pop uh, 
aquatic vegetation. So even doing mapping of where are the patches of vegetation, and that's likely where we'd expect the grass carp if we're going to go targeting grass carp. So lots of knowledge gaps to sort of fill in to try to get at um, eradication of the species in Lake Erie. Egg sampling. So there's this whole modeling that the U.S. Uh, Geological Survey does where they sort of piece together grass carp information, egg buoyancy information, temperature and flow of rivers. You can actually predict where in the river spawning would occur, where in the river you should sample for eggs if you want to try to detect if eggs are there. Um, so, so lots of sort of folks in the modeling world working on grass carp. Uh, on the telemetry side, and this seems kind of counterintuitive, you would think every grass carp you get your hands on, you should kill. Um, but we actually are tagging and maintaining about 50 grass carp at large in Western Basin of Lake Erie that have telemetry tags in them. So tra transmitters where we can track them. And th this map with the yellow dots is all the places in Lake Erie where there's a stationary receiver. Think of it like an easy pass uh, toll booth, if you will, on the highway. So anytime a carp swimming around with that transmitter in it, it's close to one of these yellow dots, it pings, and you have a date and time of when that happened. And so researchers can learn a lot about the, the seasonal and year-to-year -year movements of grass carp, the ones that are alive, which will ultimately help target and really put forth good effective effort when you're trying to eliminate the masses. And then of course, what you would think what you would do with the species you're trying to er eradicate, there's a ton of removal happening. So these, uh, the University of Toledo maintains what we call grass carp strike teams, and they are out there uh, flying the waters throughout the summer and spawning months, trying to capture and remove grass carp. And so these are just some pictures from some of those fun events. Um, just a little bit of, of sort of data here. So this is across the years, um, the number of grass carp captured. Um, you may say that an increasing catch rate would mean a growing population, and there'd be some of that, but this is raw numbers of catches. And so also across time has been a, been a much more ramped up effort at capturing these grass carp. So I, I don't know if we're at the point where there's an exact population estimate, but just because this curve is going higher doesn't necessarily mean the population is growing. It's just that they're getting much more effective and, and robust at capturing these. And the colors just kind of represent all the different places. So by and large, yellow and green, Sandusky and Maumee rivers, you can see, uh, a little bit in Lake Erie proper, a little bit in Huron, little slices in the Grand and Cuyahoga and the Black River. Looking at every grass carp that's captured, gets tested for is it diploid, reproductive, or is it triploid, sterile? And um, the majority of the fish being caught are indeed diploid, reproductive, um, especially in the Maumee and Sandusky there, you can see, you know, um, the Sandusky has a, a much higher proportion of diploid grass carp. Moving over to you know the other, you know closer to us, the Grand, the Cuyahoga, Black. Um, so few fish, but generally seems like it's triploid being sh being uh, shown up with an exception there on the Grand River. So a little bit about the the, the money and the costs of this one. So uh, the Ohio Division of Wildlife spends roughly two to three hundred thousand dollars a year on grass carp research and control. Now there's also money being spent by the USGS and other partners. Um, but if we contrast just simply ODNR's expenditures, the two to three hundred thousand on grass carp control, with the fact that uh, through uh, Governor DeWine's initiatives, the Ohio Department of Natural Resources is putting upwards of forty-two million a year on the ground as part of the H2 Ohio project. And actually, I just pulled out these numbers for H2 Ohio projects that are specific to Lake Erie coastal wetlands. And so, you know, for the habitat specifically that grass carp would exploit, you know, we're putting, you know, tens of millions of dollars uh, towards projects of restoration for H2 Ohio. The, I would again say the two to $300,000 a year on grass carp is, is money well spent. All right, the last species story, I see I have about 15 minutes. I'll try to pick up the pace here. Steelhead. Um, so steelhead trout are a, a much sought after recreational species. As I said, they're, they're native to the West Coast of the US uh, and, and they also kind of, you know, oceanic, move into the rivers, a spawn, kind of like the sea lamprey uh, life history, if you will. And so in Lake Erie that translates and in the Great Lakes in general, being in the lake and then coming into the tributaries to spawn, it's when they're in the tributaries to spawn that they're providing, you know, the, the brunt of their recreational value. It's stream anglers in the fall, winter, and spring that are generally targeting the steelhead. Um, I'll try to save the time and I'll skip some of the strains, but suffice it to say that we sort of shifted from some hatchery domestic strains of steelhead to capturing 
spawning run steelhead from various rivers in Michigan and Wisconsin, generally to create better hatchery survival, better river returns, better fishing, um, but, but steelhead nonetheless. Uh, the Division of Wildlife has sort of been stocking them in earnest since you know, the mid to late 80s. Uh, the colors in this figure just kind of deal with changes in life stage that we stock or changes in strain. And so most of the program has been fish from the Little Manistee River in Michigan stocked in the spring as yearlings. Um, and we're stocking right around 450,000 uh, yearling steelhead a year from, late, for, uh, from the Ohio Division of Wildlife into Lake Erie. That number is, is worked out in partnership with the other states and Ontario on Lake Erie um, to all come to a cooperative agreement on how many fish collectively should be stocked to consider you know, the balance of the whole Lake Erie, Lake Erie ecosystem as a whole. So states aren't just willy nilly stocking, it's done in concert with the, with the Great Lakes uh, Fish Commission and the Lake Erie Committee. So a little bit about steelhead uh, trout fishing. So like I said, it's largely an in-stream fishery. It's when the fish are running into the lake that anglers are targeting them. It's a very high release rate type of fishery. M most fishing is catch and release. Um, we do have a two fish daily limit in place for people that do wish to catch them. Uh, it is a growing sector of recreational fishing. Um, fishing and hunting as a whole nationally is slowly sort of uh, decreasing over time. Steelhead fishing is increasing. It's um, gaining in popularity. Uh, anglers are generally satisfied with this fishery. Anytime we do sort of opinion type work, uh, we get sort of high satisfaction. And really, we're called Steelhead Alley. Um, people come from as far away as Europe to fish for steelhead here in Northeast Ohio. So it is a, is a nationally and internationally recognized fishery. It's very you know, specialized, uh, high avidity among the anglers, high gear costs, high participation. Uh, some studies we've done show that uh, uh, anglers are traveling from most Ohio counties and representing about 80% of the states that are east of Mississippi um, are represented by anglers coming into Ohio to visit for steelhead. As I said, we stock 450,000 annually. Uh, here's kind of the numbers as they break down across the six program rivers. Um, don't need to really get into the numbers, but just sort of pointing out these major Lake Erie North, you know, tributaries are where we stock the fish as yearlings, they go out into the lake or grow, and then they come back in to provide that river fishery. So a little bit about program costs here. So this, these numbers are getting to be a decade old now. Uh, we don't have any more updated sort of audit cost information, but nonetheless, the, the comparison I make will be relative. So at the time, about 60 cents uh, per fish to re rear a steelhead is probably a little higher now. Like I said, we raise and release 450,000 steelhead a year. That comes out to about $260,000 a year. That's what we consider the steelhead program cost for the Division of Wildlife. That's about 12% of the Division of Wildlife statewide hatchery budget. So how does that compare to the sort of economics of fishing? So we know that each year on average, we have somewhere around 750,000 resident Ohio licensed anglers. Um, through other survey work we've done, we're fairly confident that right around 10% of our licensed anglers report that they at least sometimes fish for steelhead. Um, so that amounts to about 75,000 steelhead anglers annually. We did some work with OSU Human Dimensions folks a handful of years ago, and they did some pretty robust survey work that showed that on the average, a, a steelhead angler spends about $800 a year on their equipment and travel. So if we sort of do that $800 a year per angler math on 75,000 steelhead anglers, we get about a $65 million annual contribution to Ohio's economy. So uh, comparing that to the cost of the steelhead program, I would say a 250 fold uh, return on investment is, is money well spent. So is money well spent on recreation? Is it money well spent ecologically? Um, so we've, do, we've done some various data looks and we're in the process of, of doing more, um, but just kind of a, a real quick snapshot. What I did here is I just grabbed Ohio EPA's index of biological integrity scores. So basically think of this as the higher the score, the better the fish community as a whole is. Numbers, biodiversity, just you know, the health of the fish community. And so higher is better, low is worse. And these three lines are the Chagrin, Grand River, and Ashtabula plotted out over the same sort of duration that the steelhead program has occurred. And, you know, as you see there, the Grand and Ashtabula 
over time are, are seeing increasing um, IBI scores as a trend. Uh, the chagrin kind of, if you look at the blue dots themselves, it, they're pretty tight across time. Um, the trend slopes a little low, but as folks maybe on this group uh, know, being associated with the chagrin, there's, you know, it's sort of the most human affected of these three streams. And, and there's other things at play affecting the IBI scores. Um, so, you know, I, I just throw this up there as a contention that, you know, although it's not direct apples, you know, to apples, um, I, if steelhead were having a, a noticeable negative effect on the fish community over the decades, we would not see increasing IBI scores. Um, so that's just sort of one sort of ecological look at places where we are stocking in steelhead. Okay, so are all species created equal? I should say, are all non-natives created equal? So uh, wrapping up here, a couple more slides and we'll be done. Um, kind of a highly cited paper in the world of invasion ecology uh, the authors state that a non-native species should only be considered harmful if the changes it enacts within the naive ecosystem leads to a measurable loss of diversity or change in ecosystem functioning. And the framework that these authors put out there was sort of these five measures to look through, uh, predation, habitat degradation, competition for resources, hybridization and disease transmission. And so if one or more of these boxes are checked strongly, then you would say this non-native species is also harmful, which brings us back to some of those sort of terminologies of invasive versus non-native versus um, harmful, you know, nuisance species, those type of terms. So, so let's look at this framework for sea lamprey. Um, we could debate where, what boxes should be checked, but here's how I check them. Uh, certainly they predate. I mean, that is the major concern of them is predating on native uh, fishes in Lake Erie, any fish in Lake Erie for that matter. And they also uh, compete for resources. So in the in-stream spawning stage, there are native lamprey in these streams as well. And so there's a very clear, you know, spatial uh, habitat competition of sea lamprey spawning versus native lamprey. So for grass carp, uh, definitely habitat degradation. We talked about the, the immense eating of aquatic plants and destroying Lake Erie uh, wetlands and marshes, as well as then the competition for resources in that other native fishes like northern pike, let's say, that need to have those wetland plants for successful spawning. Now their spawning habitat is destroyed. So, you know, grass carp check at least two of the boxes. Steelhead are a little more interesting. I put questions, question marks, because I don't want to be so bold as to say, absolute zero on all this. Um, from a predation standpoint, um, you know, primarily, you know, in stream when they come in to spawn, there are native stream fishes. Obviously we're seeing IBI scores for the most part still can improve over the decades as water qualities and habitats improve in the rivers. Um, we're not seeing any noticeable effect of predation from the data looks. Obviously they're eating something, so I'm not saying they're not predating. Um, and then from a competition of resources standpoint, especially thinking about in lake as you know, they're really doing the vast majority of their growth, um, their diets are you know, directly kind of in line with the lake whitefish and lake trout, those sort of deep water pelagic species um, where the Lake Erie Committee is sort of managing them collectively based on the prey base. So you know, I have put sort of these very light, uh, sort of the red, you know, thinking of a stop sign, green, yellow, and red, put uh, sort of green and yellow question marks on those two topics. I certainly would not say a red check is, is uh, warranted for any of those categories. So sort of my contentions, I look at this, I would say, no, it's certainly not all non-natives are created equal. I think they all have their own story. Um, they're all worth looking at the ecological effects, the economic effects and costs and benefits. And uh, we know that Non-natives aren't going away. It's a reality we live in. We're at 180 plus aquatic species, and I'm sure we'll, we'll see more. So, um, you know, I guess I hopefully you found this kind of interesting to think about these, these few stories of species and maybe a little thought provoking as we sort of think about the, the words we use, whether it's in sort of a citizen science world around the dinner table in a professional environment, if you work in ecology in a media sense, um, you know, it's easy to, to take a you know, a, a sort of a seductive word like invasive species or something, but I think the words we use matter and I think they're not all the same when we talk about non-native species. And so, um, yeah, hopefully this was a little sort of thought provoking on the, the, the cost and the effects of non-natives. So if there's time, I'd be happy to take questions. Uh, I'm probably right up against it here. And here's my contact information. All righty, questions. 
All right, I have one that's quite interesting because I was kind of wondering the same thing. Um, if you catch a fish with a land prey attached to it, what is the best action to take? Twist, minor surgery, burn, or should we just report it to ODNR? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I, I don't know that there's a absolute, you should do this and shouldn't do that. Um, it probably depends. I mean, if you want to harvest the fish that it's on anyways, just do whatever it takes to kill that lamprey um, mm -hmm. and harvest the fish. I mean, the fish, other than the fact that it kind of has a wound on the flesh where the lamprey was, it's not, you know, inedible on the rest of the flesh for the fish. It's a, if it's a species that you're wanting to release, you know, as healthy as possible, although they might be kind of on borrowed time anyways, um, I would probably still yank it off and try to kill the lamprey, but I certainly wouldn't judge you if you just put the whole <laughs> collective back in the water and reported it in. Um, you know, all of our indices of lamprey wounds are derived, as I understand it, from sort of biologist netting surveys to kind of keep the effort consistent and then you tally the marks it, relative to the effort. But I, I think our, our Lake Erie offices would still be interested to hear of reports of catches. So I, I would not hesitate to, you know, email uh, wildinfo.com or, or .gov, I should say. So. Okay, well, I yeah. guess what's the best way to get it off the fish? Uh, I, I don't know for sure. So I hate to say, maybe there, maybe there's somebody that does this more than me that would have a method. I would probably hmm. just twist, twist and pull. Yeah, because their their teeth are kind of like screw, like almost looks like a screw. That's right. Yeah, they really embed themselves. I mean, think about how strong a fish is when they swim and lamprey holds on. So, yep. yeah. Yeah. It is, it's very interesting, um, but yeah, about the non-native and invasive, um, I try to like explain to people that I, I like plants, so usually I go with plant things like, all right, a hosta, it's non-native, but it doesn't do anything, like it doesn't harm anything, where like garlic mustard, it's invasive, get rid of it. <laughs> yeah. Um, me just double check to make sure I didn't miss any more questions. It's the only major question we have, but I guess, um, so we know how the sea lamb prey came in and kind of like how the grass carp, are there like any other, like, I guess, um, species that you guys are concerned that are gonna get past any of the barriers? Yeah, okay, that's a great question. So there are uh, big head and silver carp in um, the Mississippi and Illinois river systems, mm -hmm. um, really right up to the, the the big electric barrier in Chicago. So I mean, we could you could do a whole presentation about the Ohio sanitary, the Chicago sanitary and ship canal. So this interesting sort of canal structure that connects the Des Plaines River, I believe, with Lake Michigan. Um, and again, for shipping and commerce, that's the purpose. So now you have a water connection and fish swim. Um, and so there's a, gosh, going on 20 plus year now, electric barrier in, you know, out to Juliet area of Chicago suburbs um, across the canal to, to keep. And I think since then, since, you know, I've sort of seen it last, I think they've added um, maybe strobe lights or bubbles. They've added very stimuli to, to turn fish back and still let, you know, barges and ships through. Um, but yeah, it's, I mean, it, it feels like it would just be a matter of time till Big Head and Silver Carp would get into Southern Lake Michigan. Um, that being said, I mean, there was a lot of work happening on those species when I was in grad school, which is now starting to tick back 20 plus years. And that I know of, it's they're still not in Southern Lake Michigan. So I would say that is being effective right now. Okay. Um, um, I'm just thinking because I'm in Jaga County. Um, People like best, I guess, if you don't want your goldfish anymore, probably shouldn't put it in your local waterway, right? Yes. Yeah, so <laughs> my stance will maybe sound harsh to some people, but any fish you don't want, like throw in the field, throw in the grass, throw in the garden. Um, yeah. It's just not worth putting these species into other water bodies. Um, Sometimes even native species have been in ponds and there's disease issues, you know, there's laws revolving around where you can release fish or not. Um, but yeah, I mean, even with the bait side of things, um, even when my kids were little, you know, we'd have bait that we, you know, minnows that we didn't completely use and kind of explaining to them even young, like, 
hey, we're going to like get rid of these here in the brush, not let the little fishies loose in the lake um, because you know there's plenty of bait that you hope are just fathead minnows, but unless you're gonna look through each one, and you know, unless you're impaling it with a hook and essentially killing it the fish with, you know, discard your unused bait. That's sort of the slogan there. Okay. So. Um, I have a question here. Uh, are we seeing a lot of the sea lamb preys in the traps at the Harper's Field Dam? Yeah, okay. So obviously the person asking that question mm -hmm. sort of knows the context there. Yeah. I don't know the latest data on those traps. So I, I, I would hesitate to, to say that. Um, the Fish and Wildlife Service does check and maintain those traps. It is part of their sort of assessment. Um, I would say, the, and I forget um, oh, where in Michigan, but the, the main sea lamp ray control office is there in Michigan. If you get on the US Fish and Wildlife Service's website, follow the links to sea lamp ray, you absolutely get sort of the sea lamp ray program office contact. They would certainly share trap data from, from there and elsewhere that they have these traps as well, so. All right, um, well, I got two questions, pretty much the same thing, just worded differently, but does the uh, lampreside hurt any native um, aquatic animals or probably even land animals? Okay. Yeah. So yeah, yes, it does. I mean, that's the simple answer. Um, and then of course, true biology, you know, it depends. So mm -hmm. um, I don't know of a terrestrial linkage that I okay. sort of heard about. I, I don't want to say there's no studies out there, but definitely what we see and, and hear about the most is sort of the aquatic, I, I say bycatch, but I mean, really it's by kill, I guess, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, unintended lethal targets. So um, there's species that are more susceptible than others. So I guess let's first start. TFM is a lampricide. So it is just as lethal to native lamprey larvae as it is sea lamprey. So you are going in every three to five years knowing that if you're effective at the sea lamprey, you're also going to be effective at killing native lamprey in those habitats. So that is a, a sort of risk cost that you just accept as part of the program. This okay. program has a lot of that kind of like valuation trade-offs because there is good and bad associated. Um, there's other species that are that are fairly susceptible. Uh, stone cat mad toms is a, is a cute little fish that, um, you know, little catfish that is quite susceptible to, to TFM at doses just a little higher than it should be because there's this range. There's the range for lamprey, then there's sort of the flirty range, and then there's like you'd have to really nuke things beyond. Stone cats sit there at the pretty, pretty susceptible. And also uh, mud puppies, so mud puppy salamander are also fairly susceptible. Um, and there is some, the Division of Wildlife is funding some work through OSU looking at some mud, pup, mud puppy population ecology um, to sort of look at aspects because they're, they're so like under, unstudied and hard to understand. But I mean, they're long lived. Um, and so you think about like, let's say some minnows that might die from a TFM treatment, you're only treating every three to five years, you have multiple minnow life cycles happening in between. Um, I, I forget the exact years, but it might be 15 to 20 years till a mud puppy is reproductive and mature in reproducing. So now that individual had to survive multiple treatments. So there, there is some aspects there that, that are being looked at. Um, Again, it really comes down to managing those doses just correctly. I know the Fish and Wildlife Service sometimes takes a lot of heat about it, but they take it very seriously. They're playing with nature and they get they get sort of some curveballs thrown at them. But that's part of what that trailer was, is it's all about chemical in relation to the water pH, as I understand it. So they're very much monitoring water pHs and flows um, as they try to mix the right amount. So so yes, uh, other things do do perish when you do a TFM treatment. The, the goal is minimizing that. Yeah. Oops. And is there in the steelhead stocking program, do you have a balance between the fall and spring um, run for the fish? Yeah. So again, yeah, that, that question is kind of coming from the fact that we over the years have stocked different strains. And, and I would say that there's probably more angler um, 
opinions on spring and fall runs that may be super solid biological support of spring or fall. Uh, I'm not going to discount that there may be some, some, you know, Mm -hmm. preferences towards one or the other among the strains. Absolutely. But no, I mean, the, the, the real honest answer there is much of our strain selection is driven by sort of the logistics of, of getting them. So um, whether it's, you know, Michigan, whether we're able to get all from there, whether we go for uh, some streams in Wisconsin, we're working with other DNRs to, to t line up with their uh, weir collections and, and take eggs that you know, beyond what they need for their programs. And then COVID kind of threw a whole different thing in where we had to go with a different strain. So, so yeah, we're not choosing strains solely to choose sort of that fall versus spring preference or tendency. Mm -hmm. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Well, I think we can go ahead and end for tonight because we are now at 8.05. <laughs> so, Everyone have a good night and thank you so much, Kurt. Yeah, absolutely. It was a very interesting talk. Um, so, all right. all right. I'll see everyone later. Bye. Thank you so much, everyone.